Uh, permit us a few moments. Uh, the, the mess up here has to do with communion. We're doing communion three different ways today uh, because we have finally decided it's okay to take it in the pew again if you are comfortable. So the way we will do that is when it comes time for communion, first of all, everybody in the United Methodist Church is welcome to partake of Holy Communion. Absolutely everybody can take communion. We want to be clear about that. Uh, the ushers will call you forward in the old time way like we used to, and I will have uh, my gloves on, and I will hand you a piece of the bread. That way, that's the safest way we thought maybe to do it. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. We still have the, um, I guess you would call it one and done communion, everything in one container. If you don't want to come forward, please get that communion now. If you don't mind, it's here. It's also, I believe, in the back. If you need gluten-free, we also have gluten-free, and it's labeled up here as well. Uh, we got a hand up here if somebody can help, him, help, help my brother out. It's also Palm Sunday, so please do not forget your palms. Uh, so we apologize for the little bit of the delay in beginning worship. We'll begin in two or three minutes. But we have, uh, Todd is not with us today to lead song, so we have recruited once again the great Jerry Groudon. Jerry's going to help us out, give him a hand. We're really thankful for Jerry coming out today and helping. Now, I need to also say something. I told you where you, you see, some of you don't know this, but you see where Jake gets his singing ability from, from his father, Jerry, who's going to help us out today. But do you know where Jerry got his singing from? Does anybody know? Some of you do know. Miss Irene? Would you stand up and be recognized, Miss Irene? Because she said no. That's okay. <laughs> When you're 97, you don't have to do anything that anybody tells you to do. That's right. But that's where Jerry gets his ability to sing. Miss Irene went out to the nursing homes for many years and also, I think, sang at the Center Street uh, picnic. Is that right? With your guitar. So we are very late. I do apologize, but we are going to begin worship this morning as soon as I find my sheet. Good morning. We'd, we'd like to thank all who are joining us on our website, YouTube, Facebook, and on WCBC. We see you and you are welcomed here. If you are seeing this message on social media, please like and share this worship service so that others can hear the message. If you'd like to stay in the loop, contact the, if you'd like to stay in the loop, contact the office and allow us to have your con contact info. Weekly emails keep you in the loop and also include devotions. You may also pick up a paper copy of these weekly reminders on the table in the parlor. In order, be, in order to be completely transparent, minutes to all church council meetings are posted on the bulletin board in the parlor. Feel free to read and ask any questions you like. Congregational responses are in bold on the screens. Today is Palm Sunday, a time when we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We do so with a keen awareness that those shouts of Hosanna will later this week turn into shouts of crucify him. Worship today begins with a procession. Proce processions have been an important part of religion throughout the ages. In the Hebrew Bible, Abraham followed God's command to move, and Moses led the Israelites to the Promised Land. People followed Jesus around Galilee and into Jerusalem. Pilgrimages were an important part of Christianity in the early years in the Middle Ages. Today, processions begin many of our worship services, demonstrating God's willingness, our willingness to follow God's call in our lives. From following Jesus around the small towns and villages of Galilee, people are now willing to follow him into the capital city of Jerusalem, ready to make him king and claim him as the Messiah, God's anointed one. Would you please rise as we begin our Palm Sunday procession with the following call to worship. It's responsive and it will be on the screen. I'll give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. I'll 
Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our opening hymn today is, Here I Am, Lord. Jerry will lead us. It's verses 1, 2, and 3, and you can sing along. I believe the words will be on our screen. Sorry for the tenor, but I've sang tenor for so long. When I do harmony, I just slide into it. It's all right. <laughs> you may be seated, and let's pray together on this Palm Sunday morning. God in pain, Jesus on trial, you watched and you suffered. And so you know our pains and sufferings. Open our hearts to understand the depths of your love. 
for humankind, that we may draw closer to you and love you all the more. We ask this through the power of the Holy Spirit that binds us to you. Amen. The scripture is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Beth Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The, cr the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let us pray. God, on Palm Sunday, you were welcomed into Jerusalem. But by the end of that week, you were condemned and crucified. What happened? Well, Lord, you just didn't meet our expectations. And that's truly what Palm Sunday is all about. Yes, there was a big regalia when you entered. We welcomed you. And that week, Lord, you had already done enough to prove who you are. You washed your disciples' feet. You continued to love and heal and forgive. When you were on trial and you were struck for answering the high priest, you said, for which of my good deeds do you strike me? Lord, truly, that is the question. Lord, we've all smitten you. We've all let you down. We come this morning as sinners seeking reconciliation and forgiveness. Let it be so according to your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Obviously, Jesus didn't meet people's expectations, but when you really think about it, he had, he's kind of done enough already. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we read about how he opened up blind eyes. Nobody had ever done that before. Last week, he's coming off the biggie where he raised Lazarus from the dead. Along the way, he forgave sinners and things like that. And he's just coming off this biggie, raising Lazarus from the dead. And he's coming into Jerusalem now to shouts of Hosanna. And as he enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, there are two uh, uh, things which emerge very quickly, two themes, two symbols. First, Jesus is riding a donkey, a coal, a fault, a foal, something other than a horse is the point here. Different gospel writers give us different things, but he's not riding a horse because kings rode horses when they came for war, when they came to start war, when they came to finish something, when they came to prove something, they rode their horse to town. When they came in peace or to make peace, they rode their donkey. He chose an ass because it was the beast on which kings came in peace, not in war. But it was his claim to kingship. He's making no bones about it. I am a king. I am your king. I'm just not the kind of king that you expect me to be. There have been rumors, yes, he is a king, but he is saying today I'm a peaceful one. He's not what they wanted. He's not what they expected. And those who came there for war, and believe me, there were zealots who came to Jerusalem, particularly on that Passover, to make war because they thought that they had a friend in Jesus. When they showed up for war and they saw Jesus riding on the donkey, they must have thought, where's the war horse? Aren't we going to overthrow the Romans today? Now, I want you to notice how deliberate Jesus was in his refusal of that role as the warrior Messiah. Every little rabbi in every little town was teaching that the Messiah would probably be a warrior Messiah, that he'd come and overthrow the Romans. But by appearing with a palm branch in his hand, the symbol of peace, and on a donkey, also a symbol of peace, the palm branch is also a symbol of victory, was he not sending a very different message than what people expected? Peace. Peace leads to victory. They wanted him. They expected him to overthrow the Romans. But that first Palm Sunday, he sent an equally strong message that it would not be done that way. And the symbolism spoke very loudly, more loudly than words. I think he's saying, will you accept me as this kind of king? 
As I said, the other gospel writers say it was a donkey, it was an ass, it was a colt, it was a foal that had never been ridden before. You get different things about what he rode into town. But the point is, it was not a war horse. And the prophet Zechariah goes to great lengths to tell us Jesus did not ride a war horse into town. The, the king was not going to ride a war horse. He comes lowly and humble and meek on a donkey. You know, Jesus arrives to town and there's not even a foal to be had. Okay, where are you going to get this? He tells his disciples, go get me a foal. It kind of reminds me of the story. My father was in Vietnam, and there was a huge supply shortage in Vietnam. By the time Vietnam rolled around, my father was in the middle of his Navy career. And his commanding officers looked at him. There was a major supply shortage in Vietnam, as we, those of us who know of the history of that conflict know. And they didn't have a Jeep. So the commanding officer just looked at my dad and said, Fred, I don't know what to tell you but you got to find a Jeep. So my dad <clears throat> said, as he said, that he had two boys in his company from New York, he said, two guys from New York. So he said to these guys from New York, guys, I need you to go downtown and come back with a Jeep. And he said an hour later, they came back with a Jeep, and an hour after that, it was painted green and had U.S. on the side of it. So it became U.S. property because they had need of it. Jesus tells his disciples, just go get me a donkey. And it seems odd to us. Now, a donkey was something that was kind of valuable, uh, it wasn't like your car, but it was like you're riding lawnmower, okay? And at this time, Jerusalem would have been swelled up with people. There would have been 200,000 people in town, all these strangers in town, and one of these strangers comes up and wants to know if they can borrow your riding lawnmower. What would you say? Nope. Why not? Well, I hate to say this, but I don't know you, and I don't know if you're going to bring my lawnmower back or not. That's why you can't have it. But this is one of those things where when we read the Bible, our way of thinking is a round hole and the Bible is a square, as, as, uh, as a round peg and we're trying to put it into a square, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, I can't, can't get it myself. But in the Bible, when somebody, these gentlemen would have come up and said, hey, we, we need your donkey, we need your foal, the answer would have been yes. And here's why. And here's where maybe we've missed it in our culture. But back then, you brought honor to your family by showing hospitality. If a stranger needed your donkey, they needed your donkey. By the same token, it brought much dishonor upon your family if you stole something. Don't you wish it was still that way today? So when these guys showed up, these strangers showed up and said, the Lord needs your donkey to ride into town. The answer would have been yes. It brings honor to my family. You need it. Here you go. No questions asked. You can have it. So they get the donkey, they procure, it, procure the donkey, like the prophet says, they ride into town on this donkey, and all of a sudden people start saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. What does that word mean? Now, we know probably, and you know if you've been in church long enough, it means save us, save us, Lord, save us now. But we have to understand something. That's what it meant when it was originally written by the prophets. It was a genuine and deep prayer of petition from the heart. But that had been several hundred years do you know how language can change over the course of a, even a generation or two? By the time Jesus rolled around, this greeting of Hosanna, God save us, had taken on a lesser meaning. It had devolved from a prayer of petition into a very informal greeting. You know how we use it, oh, God save us. Have you ever said that just out of turn? That's how some of the people who greeted Jesus that they were using that term. Not, oh, you are the one, you are Jesus, you are the Messiah, you are the King, you are the Lord, come and save us. And it devolved into almost like an informal greeting. So when people are shouting, Hosanna, 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 they're saying it much like we do, with different degrees of devotion. Some of them said it deeply from their heart. The old timers knew what it meant, save us, save us now. And the younger people, it was more informal to them. Hey, it was almost like a hey, a wave, how are you doing? But like when we say goodbye, goodbye originally meant God be with you. God be, you can see how that would be. Now we just say it. We don't mean God be with you and we say, we mean goodbye, get out of here. Language changes over time. But nonetheless, no matter how these people were saying it, for some of them it was a deep prayer of petition, a faith in Him being the Lord. For other people it was just an informal greeting like they're almost waving at Him. But no matter what, when they say this word Hosanna, the Pharisees almost had a coronary heart attack, and I'll tell you why. All these people saying, Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. I can guarantee you I know what the Pharisees said.
And it's not just because they have a beef with Jesus. It's not just because He's more popular than them. Saying this, Lord, save us, puts everybody's butt on the line. There's a nationalistic fervor burning, ready for somebody to light it with a match. And the Romans are just ready for that to happen, just waiting for that to happen so there can be another bloodbath. Shh. Keep a lid on that Hosanna stuff. Shh. I hate to say it, but I think they were right. The crowd that day was made up of followers, disciples of Jesus, and the city dwellers. The older folks knew what was happening. The tensions were high. Pontius Pilate was just appointed, and he was expected, at the risk of his own life as a Roman military officer, to keep order. He's headed to town as well to do just that. But Jesus doesn't like this nationalistic fervor. He'd have the entire city in an uproar and against him before the week is out. The next thing he does, it's not included in this scripture, but if you continue reading, the next thing Jesus does is go, and please pay attention to this, overturn the tables where the money changers were outside of the temple. He was greeted with honor, and then he goes and does that. Now, what happened was, he sees, one, of these, one day, somebody got the great idea. They said, you know, we have all these tourists coming up, especially at Passover, according to the Bible. And they've got to make all these sacrifices. They can't carry doves and rams and goats and this and that and the other. Let's open up a convenience store. So they got a permit right outside of the temple. I'm sure some people were not happy about it. But once it was there, it was there. And once people started making money at it, nobody cared because that's how we are. It seemed harmless enough to legitimize it. Go ahead. You can sell a few pigeons. Just a few permits to sell a few pigeons and that's it. By the time Jesus got there, of course, it had gotten out of control. They took advantage of each other through this system, just like the prophets told them not to. So Jesus went and overturned those tables, not out of a temper tantrum, and not even maybe out of righteous anger. Rather, His protest was against a, domina a, a, a domination system which was legitimized in the name of God. It's right outside the temple, but it's a system radically different from what Jesus was bringing that day. That system that they had set up outside the temple to make all that money, it benefited the priests and the Roman governors. It benefited a few. It was really economic exploitation, and it was commonplace. And the fact that it was right outside the temple meant that the people in the temple must have been for it, right? And over time, hey, if you can't shut down that store outside the temple, where will people get their sacrifices at? It's here so they can make their sacrifices like the Bible says. You're against God if you want to get rid of this. Well, Jesus did. Jesus is almost like He's saying, if you're going to welcome me to town as your true king, as your peaceful king, as your gentle king, this can't be here. My kingdom can't exist alongside this exploitation. Now, you might wonder, many local rabbis taught that the Messiah would be a great warrior. He'd overthrow the Romans. He wasn't. He overturned the Jews' tables first. Does that make any sense? Think about that for a moment. He dismounted his donkey of peace with a palm branch in his hand of victory and marched over to the tables. The first thing he did was overturn the money tables. He had the Jews in Jerusalem and the city dwellers on his side until he upset their economy. Much like when Jesus took the, the demons and He cast them out of the, the demoniac and cast them into the pigs. Do you remember what happened? Hundreds of pigs go and they drown themselves in the lake, and they ran Jesus out of town after that. Do you know how much several hundred head of livestock means to a local economy? We're always on Jesus' side until He upsets our pocketbook. We're always on His side until He does something that we don't want. And yeah, he kicked the devil out of the, that, generis, uh, that, that demoniac and put him into the, the swines and they went and drowned. The devil was gone, but where the heck's our economy going to come from? That's what people said. Perhaps the same thing with the money changers. He came to town. First thing he did was overturn the Jews' money tables. Hey, Jesus, I'm sure some of this is the point where he really lost it with people. I'm sure some of Jesus' brothers of a nationalist perspective probably took him aside and said, hey, listen up. We know that that thing there took advantage of people outside the temple. We understand why you did it. But why are you tearing our stuff up? 
Aren't the Romans taking more advantage of us? Why don't you go and tear their stuff up and leave our stuff alone? Let our brothers make a little bit of money. What's wrong with you? Go up to the Romans and tear their stuff up, not ours. Have you ever considered that before? But doesn't really a good cleansing begin at home? How are the Jews going to kick the Romans? How are the Jews going to show the Romans the way of peace and victory when they're taking advantage of each other outside of their place of worship? Jesus saw that as the first thing that had to go. They're taking advantage of, each, advantage of each other. That was the problem in ancient times. Still the problem today. That's what the prophets warned about. There they go, doing it again to one another. We continue to do it today. There's venture capitalism in healthcare and for-profit prisons, monetizing sickness and imprisonment. Isn't that just a lovely thing? And we watch the TV and we act like we can't stop bullets and bullies and wars and rumors of wars. We watch as divorce attorneys use children as pawns. We watch all of this stuff. We watch prices double. We watch racism, white supremacy, weekly mass shootings, genocide in a faraway land. We watch it all on TV. We know whose kingdom we're living in. We say, isn't that just terrible? We say a little prayer and we move on. And then they have us fighting with one another. They bought up the media. And they have us arguing over things like transgendered sports when prices have tripled. Doesn't that make perfect sense? Well, I know one thing. Anybody who takes on the empire will suffer. Jesus is proof of that. Speak against it and you'll get into trouble. Do anything about it and you'll get into trouble. But Jesus, couldn't he have handled this differently? Instead of going and turning over the Jews' tables where they make all the money, he should have torn up the Roman stuff and maybe just written a letter. And we could still read it today. He could have just written an editorial for the Sunday Jerusalem Times about the proper use of the temple, and that would have been better. It would have been a lot less messy. Why did he have to provoke it? Because that's how our king rolls. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to, threat to justice everywhere, and he just had to do something about it. Yeah, the Romans were a problem. The Romans were breathing down everybody's throat. That's why Pontius Pilate was coming to town. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But Jesus understood a good house cleaning begins at home. He knew the Jews. We had to get the, we, the, the Christians, the people in the church, we've got to get the log out of our own eyes before we can help the Romans with theirs. We can't change the Romans until we live right. We can't encourage the Romans to follow God until we do. Speaking of Roman power and authority, it was also on full display on Palm Sunday. There are two processions that day, and one of the biggest things that we can learn about this Scripture reading today doesn't actually come from this Scripture. Remember, I said history, tradition, reason, and experience all season the Bible for us. But there was another procession that day for sure, and it was not recorded in our Scripture. There is a man riding the to town on a war horse. It's not Jesus. It's Pontius Pilate. And I want you to get a good image of this because this happened on purpose. Jesus planned it this way. As Jesus is riding down from the Mount of Olives into town, I believe, on the east side, which the Messiah is supposed to do, on a donkey, which the Messiah is supposed to do. See, they missed that. If he's going to start a war, why is he on a donkey? They missed it, just like we missed the obvious. They painted Jesus in their image. He'll be a war horse. No, he was coming on his donkey, like the Bible said. But at the same time, he's coming like a don on a donkey with the palm branch in his hand, humble, meek, gentle, kind, mild, Pontius Pilate's coming in on the west side, and he's riding on his war horse. He's in full military regalia. He has legions of officers with him to prove his power and who's in control. You see, population in that small city of Jerusalem swelled during the Passover from 30,000 to 200,000 when the Jews, who had a nationalist fervor burning at that time, came to celebrate God's deliverance of the Jews at the hands of the Egyptian oppressors. The oppressors have just changed names, man. Now it's the Romans. The oppressors have a different name. But Pilate chose this time to enter Jerusalem also to show who was oppressed and who was the oppressor, and to make no bones about it. Because behind Pilate and around Pilate, surrounding Pilate on his war horse, 
were legions of Roman cavalry, Calvary and war horses and military regalia. It was like a military parade. And all those 200,000 people, when this big military procession came in the tent, you better get out of the way. And that's another thing to show you who's in control. Move it. We're coming through. Oh, and by the way, this big military thing that might the pilot is showing will come to fruition here at the end of the week as there will be public crucifixions out here on this hill for seditionists and anybody who would like to speak up against this. We know a guy who's going to end up on one of those crosses. But we'll let one of them go just to be nice. And you can even choose who it is. It's interesting that Jesus chose to enter Jerusalem as he did on this day when he knew Pontius Pilate would be coming the other side of town. Now, he went back to Jerusalem several times that week, but he never entered town that way before. He entered from the east, as I said, riding down from the Mount of Olives out of Bethany, which is how the Messiah is supposed to come, from the east, from the Mount of Olives, and on a donkey. He did it to a T. At the same time, on the western side, Pontius Pilate is riding in full military regalia, his war horse. He came to proclaim the power of the empire. Jesus' procession that day was not as big, not as powerful, probably not even as noticeable, but it proclaimed a very different kingdom that runs by very different rules. This is happening at the same time. It was standard practice for the governors, Roman governors of Judea, to be in Jerusalem during major festivals like this, not because they cared about their Jewish subjects, they were there for crowd control. Pilate normally lived in Caesarea by the sea, but he brought his soldiers in to reinforce the area where Jesus was. Other than imperial power, he was clearly making that point. Pilate was also making a show of imperial theology because he wrote in that day, not just as Pontius Pilate, the governor, the ruler from Rome, but their rulers were also declared to be sons of God. Did you know that? He had two sons of God marching in Jerusalem the same day, two people who claimed to be the Son of God. It began with Augustus. He ruled from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. His father was said to be the god Apollo. Inscriptions refer to him as the Son of God, Lord, Savior, the one who had brought peace upon the earth. His successors continued to take on these divine titles. Jesus wrote in as the Son of God. So did Pilate. Jesus planned his counter procession in advance to happen on this day and at this time. And I guess the only question is, which procession are we going to join? Which one are we going to follow? The one in this world that plays by its rules or the kingdom of God? Jesus did this on purpose. But, you know, I have to tell you, Palm Sunday is hardly a joyful day. Here's how I feel about Palm Sunday. Yes, we welcomed Jesus, but we did so in a very superficial way. They welcomed him only as the kind of Messiah they wanted. When they found out that he wasn't, the, wel the welcome left. Now, these religious holidays, today's a major religious holiday, Palm Sunday. They've already stolen Christmas from us, right? You know that. Christmas is about the, the elves and the solstice and the candy canes, right? Easter, too. We're coming up on Easter, but, man, we're celebrating springtime and bunnies more than we are Jesus, right? St. Patrick's Day and Valentine's Day, we surrendered those a long, long, long time ago. Ash Wednesday is weird, and it deals with sin. You can't even get 10% of your congregation out for that. But the holiday we've done the biggest number to and missed the point of, I think, is this one, Palm Sunday. They welcome Jesus. What do we celebrate? Why are we celebrating? Well, it's the day Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem, but wasn't he welcomed in a superficial way? He was welcomed as a warrior Messiah who was coming to undo Rome, but when they found out he was the humble prophet on a donkey, they didn't want anything to do with him. The events of this coming week make that obvious. We make Palm Sunday an idealized and joyous procession, which it's really not. So what is Palm Sunday really all about, Charlie Brown? You remember, what's Christmas about, Charlie Brown? Well, what's Palm Sunday all about, Charlie Brown? It's a Sunday that in some ways we have idealized and miss it for what it really is. What Palm Sunday, what happened on Palm Sunday was people missed the point about God. 
That's what we're reminded of today. Palm Sunday is not a day necessarily to be happy about or proud of. He was welcomed, yes, but in a superficial way. How often does God appear to us, do miracles, speak to us, lead us, but we ignore it or turn from it because it's not what we want God or expect Him to do. That's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. That's what it's all about, Charlie Brown. You got to accept Jesus. The point of today is accept Him for who He is. He's not on the war horse. He's on the donkey. He doesn't have a rifle in His hand. He has a palm branch. He didn't come to overthrow the Romans. He came to love them. He didn't come to set their house right. He came to set us right. You know, the Lord has something, needed something else this week. Take a moment to reflect on how many times we've missed God because He didn't do what we wanted Him to do. This coming week, the Lord has need of something. You, your time, your attention, your heart. Because many of us who attend today won't attend again until next week, which is the big celebration of Easter. We all need a reminder of this story, though. What happened in between? To take our place around the table of the upper room saying, is it I who will deny you? To walk with Jesus in the darkness of the garden. To skip over what happens this week is to ignore Jesus' request in the garden to tarry with me and pray with me just one hour. You got a homework assignment this week. Fulfill Jesus' request. How many of your requests has he fulfilled? He asked for one thing. Will you pray with me for one hour? Will you stop and cry with me in the garden? Because, yes, we're welcoming him. He's coming to town, but he's going to do a number on that town, and the world's not going to be the same when he gets done. He needs us. He needs us to tarry with him. You know, few will stand with him on Calvary. We'll all go to the empty tomb and look, but few will stand with him on Calvary. Few will take their place around the table. And I ask you to do that this week. We need to stand on that skull-shaped hill, hear the hammer as it drives the nails into his hand, to hear his raspy voice offer forgiveness to the people who are doing it, and to contemplate the unimaginable love of his kingdom, which he's bringing. Now, if you want to get, join the other procession, go ahead, but that's a hard world to try to make it in. He comes as a peaceable, humble man, In fact, he's described very well in our next verse. I want Bryce to read our verse from Philippians, and I want you to ponder what kind of Savior and Messiah he might be, and then we'll join one another around the communion table. The Scriptures from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. As we said earlier, everybody, everybody, from the least to the greatest, no matter how much you think you failed God this week or in the previous weeks, everybody is welcome around this table. We meet Jesus in these elements. For the first time in three years, we're going to invite you to come forward if you wish to receive Holy Communion. The ushers will do that in a moment. If you're not comfortable coming forward, that is just fine. You may still come forward and grab some of our communion over here. Um, If you're gluten-free, grab some, but everybody is welcome. Please be patient with us. We haven't done this in a long time, but it isn't hard. When the ushers tell you to come up, come on up, and we'll all receive Holy Communion. Are you ready? All right, please turn to page 12 in your United Methodist hymnal. I've got Bryce helping me today. When we call you forward, uh, we have gloves with us, and we will hand you a piece of bread so that we don't, uh, we're, we're being as wise with this as we possibly can. If you have suggestions, we'll listen to them, certainly. Again, it's been three years since we've done this, so Terry with us, please.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. And Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now with clean hearts and clean hands, I'm getting my glove on. Welcome, those of you who come forward to the union. I don't know how we can do this at the same time. If um, we're inviting people to come forward, we probably should, well, we didn't think about that. I guess we just need to do it at the same time. Okay. We'll call you forward.
gracious God, give us, give us the mind that was in Christ Jesus, willing to empty ourselves so that, that you may have room, room to, to dwell, dwell in us. us. Draw, Draw us closer, closer this week into the, into the mind of Christ, Jesus, that we, we may understand more deeply, deeply his, life his life and death and love for us. For us. In your Amen. name we pray. Amen. Amen. During our offering, we have a number for you. It's a really old uh, number. It'll take us just a moment to get tuned up. But it is, when the roll is called up yonder, I don't even know if that's still in our hymnals. If it is, does somebody want to look in the back and see if, uh, if it's there? And you can sing along with us if it is. Jake, are you around? Coming out, buddy. Okay. Grab us some chairs, I think. And, uh, of course, this is our offertory, which we give you today. There are a variety of, way, a variety of ways that you can give. Thank you. Is this where you want me to sit? I don't uh, want to catch you up in the eyeball. Okay, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> you can go online. Our food pantry challenge was very successful, and we're very thankful for everybody who helped out. Of course, that's kind of old news now. We raised $6,000. Uh, January and February are the slimmest months in any church, anybody will tell you. We certainly appreciate all of your giving during those months and any months, but if you can give now to our general fund, we would much appreciate it. Uh, that's where your money would be of the most use. You can go online. You can give here. Are you ready? I got a quick story if I'm turned on here. Am I good? Am I on good? Uh, I listen to 97.1 FM, Reveal FM, as soon as I get out of bed in the morning, so I go to bed every night. I used to be a secular musician playing all kind of rock and roll, country music, what have you. And uh, nothing wrong with that at all, still do. But the Lord um, came to me probably two years ago, and I've uh, recommitted my life. So that's something I listen to every day in the radio, and I heard a cool story the other day. Uh, no names were given. I don't even know the pastor that told me. Probably Damien Kyle, if you're familiar. He's one of, my, one of my favorites. Anyway, this dude, he was a city dude and had him a fancy job doing some kind of finance and high money kind of roller. And he got off work one day and jumped on the subway heading home had all his computers and his whiz bangers and his noisemakers and all of his business stuff with him, trying to get some work done on the subways on his way home. And his father came on board the subway with three young boys that were kind of acting up, getting on this guy's nerves as he was trying to get his work done. So eventually he threw his paperwork down on the floor and he got up and walked back to that dad and he says, you know, he says, can't you get your kids under control? I'm trying to get something done here. And the dad looked up at him with the face the man couldn't describe. And he said, sir, he says, I'll take any advice you have. He said, we just came from the hospital and they lost their mother. So it's just a reminder when we're out there in our daily walk and you get ticked off because you're waiting in line because somebody's too slow ringing you up or what have you. You never know what they face before you met them that day. So just always remember that we're the light in the world. And I'm not pointing the finger. I'm guilty of it myself. We're all brothers and sisters here. But just try to remember that story and carry it with you this week. You never know what somebody else is dealing with. Amen. Amen. This is an old one. My grandfather taught me this years ago when the roll is called up yonder. Are you ready? Yes, sir. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the eternal breaks, eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when that roll is called up yonder i'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather on their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when that roll is called up yonder i'll be there take it away frank Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. 
And when all his life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when that roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, when that roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when that roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you all. everybody who shares their musical talents with us and I should say as we are in a giving phase here in our worship uh, with a variety of ways to give and I have seen many people throughout the years give of their time to help the church and uh, in a few weeks I guess there'll be a bathroom downstairs we're opening up and uh, there's a person here who's done a whole lot of work on that uh, probably doesn't want me to mention their name but I just want you to know we see it we see all the things that many of you have done throughout the years to keep the church up both inside and out and we're very appreciative of that. Thank you so very much. Dedicate our offerings, our money, all of our efforts, everything we give to the Lord, we now dedicate. Please pray with me. Holy God, sovereign over power and pain, glorious triumph and deep disappointment, we enter this holy week bringing our tithes and offerings to your altar and leaving them here and I hope that you will use them to make the world a more loving and compassionate place. We are reminded through the scripture that you sent two of your disciples out to make the world ready for your coming. Go into the village, find the donkey, tell them the Lord has a need. Remind us that your kingdom breaks into the world, not as a spectacle for us to witness, but as a parade where we are called to make a working contribution. We pray in the name of the one who comes, not just for the parade, but for the cross at the end of it. Amen. Please rise. Jerry, will you help us with This Is The Day? And go tenor on us. You gonna go tenor on us? No, Sounded good the first time. All right. It's in the hymnal, if you want to follow along in the hymnal, or the words will be on the screen. Yeah, it's page 657, and I would appreciate your help. <laughs> It's tough to follow Jacob and Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Receive now this benediction, and it is responsive. You'll see the responses on the bulletin. Give thanks to God, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. We go from this place crying out for salvation. Come, save us, Hosanna. 
we go from this place ready to follow Jesus to the garden, to the cross, and to the tomb. We go from this place ready to pay attention as the waving palms turn to a sentence of crucifixion. Come save us, Hosanna. We go from this place knowing that even death, even in death, God's love endures. Come save us, Hosanna. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Good Friday's at 7 o'clock. I'm sorry, Easter egg hunt at 6. Good Friday service at 7.